two centriole, the mother centriole, and the daughter centriole. Here you see the microtubal triplet blades. And they are the centrosome is or the, in, in, in the form of the centrosome, the centrioles are surrounded by a matrix of proteins called the PCM. Now, a special feature of centrioles is that when you look at electron, electron micrographs, uh, so here you see a longitudinal section of two centrioles, mother central and daughter central, and here a cross section uh, along this uh, region here. You see that these microtubal triple blades are arranged into a ninefold symmetry. And this ninefold symmetry is actually uni almost universally conserved throughout all organisms that contain centrioles. And it has been discovered since more than 50 years and somehow remained a bit mysterious from where this ninefold symmetry actually arises. And this ninefold symmetry, moreover, is used as a template for um, the universal ninefold radial symmetry of cilia and flagella because it's this structure that is used then to template the formation of cilia. And this ninefold symmetry is then conserved also in these, in these structures. Now, another feature of centrioles is that, like DNA, they get duplicated once per cell cycle. So right after mitosis, when a centrosome um, leaves mitosis, these two centrioles that are first engaged, they disengage. And in G1, there is a, um, a, a, a cascade of, of um, activities that launch the formation of procentrioles at the proximal end of the two centrioles. These procentrioles, they elongate, mature, acquire the PCM to form two new centrosomes that can then be used during mitosis, during chromosome segregation. At this stage here, a decision can be taken in the cell to transform the centrosome into basal bodies for templating, such as mentioned, um, as cilia. Now, in multiciliated cells, there is also, uh, besides this template-based mechanism, also a de novo pathway where the cell can generate many uh, centrioles and basal bodies for producing multiple cilia. Now, uh, some 10 years ago, people have started to look at the molecular events or structural events that give rise to this newly born centriole. And basically, based on electron microscopy uh, 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 studies, the first structure that appears during procentriole formation is this so-called cartwheel structure, which then assembles the microtubule triple blades around it. So this is a side view of the process, and this is also typically what you find in, 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 uh, uh, in textbook um, figures, how these processes go. And the, the basic model that is proposed since several years and that is acknowledged by most of the people in the field is this so-called scaffold model, where the cartwheel scaffolds the assembly of the microtubule tipper blade at their periphery. Now, here you see a representation of the cartwheel based on electron microscopy studies. The cartwheel is characterized by a central hub of 20 to 25 nanometers in diameters. It contains radial spoke and a pinhead structure which connects the cartwheel to the microtubule triplet blades. Now, people also started to look at what are the key players that launch this um, procentrial formation pro program and amongst um, uh, the several hundreds of proteins actually that localize to the centrosome, it turned out that only a handful of proteins are really essential to launch this program. At the very beginning, there is a master kinase that triggers procentrial formation. Then there is a protein called SAR6 that plays a role uh, during cartwheel formation and then additional proteins that um, make uh, ensure that the microtubules can be assembled around this cartwheel structure. And we got interested in this protein SAR6 because SAR6, as I just mentioned, is an essential protein for central formation. It localizes to the cartwheel and it was proposed to um, determine the ninefold symmetry of the cartwheel and, by, uh, uh, and because of this might also be uh, based on this scaffolding model, important for determining the ninefold symmetry of the centriole per se. Moreover, it's one of the best conserved centriole protein across evolution, so hinting that its function is really important. 
And the question that we set out in this project initially is, how does SAR-6 contribute to the establishment of this ninefold symmetry of centrioles? And we started with in vitro work by looking at the protein itself. So SAR-6 is uh, from C. elegans is a relatively small protein, 500 amino acid. It constitutes of an N-terminal domain and a coil-coil domain. And we, perf we produced this protein recombinantly and looked at it at um, using rotary metal shadowing electron microscopy. And it, the, the particles that we found in our micrographs fit actually quite nicely the domain prediction from the sequence. So we see a rod and a global um, uh, uh, particle at the extremity of this rod. And based on additional biophysical experiments, we came out um, uh, of this, uh, to formulate this model of how SAR-6 looks like. So we have a dimeric structure mediated by this coil-coil. We have two uh, entramal globular heads that are fused to each of these uh, monomers in the dimer and a disordered C-terminal tail. Now we got interested in the structure of this N-terminal domain because the coil-coil, basically, you can predict how a coil-coil looks like. And when we crystallized it, uh, we were not too much surprised. We found, as predicted from sequence, a global domain made of some alpha helices and beta sheets. However, in the asymmetric unique of our crystal, we discovered that this internal domain forms a dimer, a homodimer, that is mediated by this beta-6, beta-7 loop. And when we looked at the sequence conservation on the surface of the monomer, uh, we realized that this dimer is actually established by highly conserved residues. And typically, if you find highly conserved residues on the surface of a protein that somehow are involved in the interaction, this tells you typically that this is of functional importance. And uh, specifically, what we found is a highly conserved uh, hydrophobic residue that sticks into a hydrophobic pocket. Now the questions, this dimer, w w is it the dimer within the SAR-6 coil-coil mediated dimer, or is this a dimer that could mediate dimer of dimer formation? And we did mutagenesis studies in combination with um, biophysical analysis, and we found that actually this dimer corresponds to uh, contacts between SAR-6 dimers. So what we do have here is we have two dimerization interfaces, one strong one mediated by the coil-coil domain and a weaker one based on biophysical experiments that is mediated by this isoleucine 154 that mediate head-head interaction of this SAR-6. And by doing so we could expect um, that this um, dimeric SAR-6 can form higher-order oligomers. Now, this higher-order oligomerization of SAR-6, is it of any physiological relevance? Important question to answer. So what we did is we took the C. elegans system, where we um, knocked out first SAR-6 and rescued it by a SAR-6 construct that is RNAi resistant and compared it to a situation where we mutated this critical isoleucine 154 residue to glutamic acid. And what we found is that while providing the wild-type protein to the system after cycle two, we ended up with um, uh, four, century old, so four centrosomes. This mutation here completely abrogated centrosome duplication. So, telling us that just one residue mutation can absolutely abrogate the machinery of centrosome duplication. And we could confirm the same result also in, in human cells. So this tells us that this oligomerization is really essential for centriole formation. But so far, we did not answer really for what it is good for. What is the role of this oligomerization? We went back to crystallography. So remember, the dimer that we solved is the dimer that mediates the oligomerization between SAR-6 dimers. So we succeeded now to crystallize also a construct that contains part of the coil-coil, but where this interface has been mutated in order to allow the protein to form crystals. We solved that crystal. We found indeed that it's a coil-coil mediated dimer. So here you have a part of the coil-coil domain. Here you have the N-terminal domains the beta-6, beta-7 loop that mediates the NN interaction are remote. 
And in this case, it's the beta 3, beta 4 loop in this region here that makes contacts with the coil coil to maintain this domain in a particular configuration. So what we do have is we have now structure of the coil coil mediated dimer and the NN dimer. And this now allows, allows us in silico to check how this oligomer looks like. Because we can start by using the coil coil dimer, superimposing the NN dimer by using just one monomer, and this templates the position of the next coil coil dimer. And when you do that, what we ended up is in a very nice uh, ring like model with a diameter of 23 nanometers. We ended up with a symmetry of nine, which is very closely, uh, well, which matches the nine-fold symmetry of the cartwheel, and also the 23 nanometer diameter are close to the diameter observed in electron microscope of this central hub of the cartwheel, which ranges between 20 and 25 nanometers. Now, the prediction of this model is that actually in vitro, we should be able to uh, reconstitute these rings, right? So we went back to electron microscopy, carefully analyzed our data again uh, using rotary shadowing EM. So here you see the dimer again with the global head and the coil coil. But occasionally, we also saw now dimers of dimers or trimers of, di of, of dimers. And we were able to measure the angle between these uh, legs of the molecules and ended up with an angle of 42 degrees, which is very close to the 40 degrees needed to build up a ring-like uh, oligomer. And occasionally, we also found ring-like particles with a diameter of 22 nanometers, again matching the 23 nanometers of our atomic ring model or the 20 to 25 nanometer diameter of the central hub of the cartwheel of the centriole. So we could now put our ring model in the center of the centriole. We extended the coil coil to their length. You can predict that based on sequence. And we saw that this is sufficient to reach this pinhead structure, which is not that nicely visible now here on the screen. The pinhead structure here to link the cartwheel to the microtubule triple blades. So this structure here um, explains a mechanism how this ninefold symmetry actually is established um, in the cell. Now, this structure uh, offers an excellent basis now to probe some or uh, test some ideas from the literature. Namely, based on the generally acknowledged scaffold model, the prediction is that the ninefold symmetry of the cartwheel, which is established by SAR6, templates the ninefold symmetry of the microtubule wall. And we can now use um, our structural information to introduce mutations and to change the symmetry of the cartwheel and assess its impact on the entire centriole. And we did that uh, using the structure. We assessed uh, the impact of mutations on SAR6 ring formation in vitro and subsequently then tested the impact of central symmetry in cells. And first, what we needed to improve is obviously also our imaging, in vitro imaging method, method to assess the symmetry changes of the cartwheel-like structures in vitro. So that's the rotary metal shadowing. It's uh, typically, first, there were, there were not that many particles found on EM grids. The resolution is quite poor, and we had to infer symmetry indirectly through the ring diameter. So we changed from EM and went to atomic force microscopy and now um, obtained very nice preparations and the very nice images of these SAR6 ring-like oligomers in vitro. And in this case, we did not have to infer symmetry from the ring diameter, but we could um, count spokes directly. So what we did is we collected several hundreds of such images. We applied to... Um, to the image classification methods um, and based on um, the density that you see here around this ring here could infer unambiguously from our classes the symmetry of each individual particle population as shown here. And what you immediately can see from that graph is that in vitro actually 
um, SAR6 does not um, establish a unique symmetry. The preference is ninefold for sure. That's consistent with what we have derived from electron microscopy. But we found also a substantial population of eight and tenfold uh, symmetric oligomers, telling us that the interfaces between the SAR6 dimers is to some extent flexible. And this gives us also the chance to change actually symmetry because it's a dynamic uh, interface. We basically have two interfaces, the NN interface here and the N coil coil interface here. And we decided to look at this interface and perform a mutagenesis study, namely the NN interface. And what we did is we first spotted all residues that participate in the interaction and employed three strategies. Uh, we mutated hydrophobic contacts, salt bridge networks, either we generated new salt bridges or eliminated salt bridges, and we also performed a cr um, assisting cross-linking approach where we covalently linked NN domains. We went, through, oops, we went through 28 mutants in total, we used two rounds of mutagenesis, and assessed all these mutants um, in terms of stability of the NN dimer using different biophysical methods. We validated our mutagenesis approach by solving the structures of all these mutants. And finally, we assessed the symmetry of these mutants in the context of the coil-coil dimer by atomic force microscopy or electron microscopy. And what we found is that, so here we have the wild type protein, um, this plays a KD of roughly 100 micromolar, so it's not infinitely stable. Um, surprisingly, although we designed the mutants um, to actually stabilize the interaction, uh, one-third of them rather destabilized the interaction. Nevertheless, we also found two-thirds of the mutants that increased the stability. And when we ass assessed the symmetry of this population here, we went from predominantly ninefold or tenfold um, symmetric particles down to even fivefold symmetric uh, oligomers. So a wide range of possibility just by introducing, applying this strategy, this mutagenesis strategy to the molecule. We decided to pick NN24, we call it NN24, um, because it's quite stable and it populates really the majority of the, of the oligomers populate symmetries that are really remote from the ninefold. So they populate rather six-fold symmetric particles. Here is the characterization of this mutant. So we crystallized this mutant. You can see that the design worked based on the strategy here. You can see here the analysis, now this time based on electron microscopy because it's stabilized. So we got many particles also in the EM. And you can see that indeed the six-fold symmetric um, form of this oligomer is the predominant species. Now, what is the impact of this NN24 mutation uh, on central symmetry in vivo? And for this, we performed experiments in Chlamydomonas, or in RTD. And so first, uh, that's the wild-type situation here. So 100% of the cells display one or two uh, flagella, and uh, shown here. If you knock out SAR6, um, you don't get any cilia formation because you don't get centriole duplication. There, are, uh, there is a special situation when you treat your cells with autolysin to remove the cell wall. You can get still a few cells that populate um, cilia, in, and this is useful then to analyze the underlying structure in 10% of the cases, but it's an artificial system a little bit. Now, and the NN24 actually rescued to 60% the situation, so 60% of the cells populated one, uh, displayed one or two flagella. We then used um, um, electron microscopy to, of plastic embedded specimens to determine the symmetry of the microtubule wall of these different um, uh, centrioles. As expected, the wild type very robustly populated only ninefold symmetric centrioles. The SAR6 null in the case of autolysin treated cells, uh, interestingly, still populated predominantly ninefold symmetric centrioles. However, the, you also we also found seven up to 11 fold symmetric centriole in these, in these uh, uh, null cells. 
and the rescue as expected restored the entire system back to, uh, to wild type. Now what happens to the NN24 and to our surprise, remember in vitro we observe six-fold symmetric centrioles. Um, in this case, we indeed were able to um, tweak the system to lower symmetry. However, we only found eight-fold symmetric structures and the predominant structures were still nine-fold symmetric. And here is a representative images of that. When we looked at the cartwheel of these NN24 um, uh, centrioles, here the nine triplet centrioles and here the eight triplet centrioles, the nine triplet centrioles either contained nine spokes or eight spokes, so the cartwheel had either a nine-fold or eight-fold symmetry, while the eight triplet centrioles, only eight-fold symmetric cartwheels were depicted. So now the question is, why is this difference, right? Why do we get in vitro a different, a different symmetry than, than in vivo? And for this, we designed a new set of experiments uh, in, in cells using chlamydomonas. And this time, we now combined mutations of SARS-6 with a mutant um, of CEP135, or called ball tanning chlamydomonas, because um, it has been reported in the literature that in chlamydomonas, this ball tan molecule anchors the cartwheel to the microtubule wall. So it's important to establish this connection here. And perhaps it's by constraining this connection that we don't can uh, that we don't see the full effect that is observed in vitro. And in this paper here, it was described by, by using N or C terminal truncation of this ball 10 uh, protein in clammy, that this one destabilizes the microtubule wall and also weakens the cartwheel microtubule wall interaction. So the first thing we did is we characterized this ball 10 delta C2 um, uh, strain and assessed the symmetry of the cartwheel in this strain. So that's a single mutant. There is no SAR6 or NN24 introduced at that stage. And we got predominantly nine triplet centrioles. Also eight triplet centrioles were observed, but predominantly nine triplet centrioles. And when you count the, uh, the, or the spokes of the cartwheel, we ended up at a symmetry of nine. And in this case, you can even see that indeed one of these spokes was detached from the microtubule wall. In many cases, though, we did not observe either any cartwheel or it was difficult to infer the symmetry of the cartwheel. So now what happens when we combined this ball 10 delta C mutant with our NN24 mutation that reduces the symmetry of the SAR6 oligomers in vitro? Now, interestingly, from eight and nine-fold symmetric particles, we now went down to six. Not in many cases, but at least we were able to further reduce the symmetry of the microtubule wall. And when we looked at um, the cartwheel symmetry of these eight triplet centrioles, we now found cartwheels that have a six, seven, or eight-fold symmetry. So closely matching what we observed in vitro. So taking now these data together and also data from the literature, departing from this model, which actually predicts that the nine-fold symmetric cartwheel uh, is formed first and is used as a template to assemble the nine-fold symmetric microtubule wall, we now would like to propose um, an, uh, uh, an alternative model, which we, ter which we termed the interdependence model, the interdependence model uh, suggests that both cartwheel and um, the microtubule wall, they assemble in parallel into transient structures with symmetries that run from eight to tenfold. And it's actually the match between um, and the interplay between the ninefold symmetric cartwheel and microtubule wall that finally can produce a stable and native centriole. Uh, with this, I want to acknowledge the people that were involved in this work. This work would, would not have been possible without a strong collaboration between uh, my lab at the Paul Scherer Institute with a group uh, in Lausanne headed by Pierre Gönzi. Um, 
and the University of Tokyo. So all the CLAMI electron microscopy work and mutagenesis work were done in the lab of Masafumi Hirona. And the AFM was performed by Daniel Müller at the ETH in Zurich. And this is our institute, the Paul Scherer Institute, for people who do not know where this institute um, is situated. So it's in Switzerland. It's situated between Basel and Zurich. It's an ETH institute. This is the building where we produce our proteins. Uh, we then take our proteins, we walk over the bridge to reach this building here. We have a very nice crystallization facility, that's the Swiss light source, Synchrotron in Switzerland, where we have a very nice crystallization facility and state-of-the-art beamlines and excellent support to perform very nice structural work. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you too, Michelle. This was like the talk was nice. An exact example of how I introduced you, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, questions, please. PhDs and postdocs first, if possible. Ah, over there, yes. I just wondered whether this protein was known to be involved in any ciliopathies or cancers associated with multiple or well, few centrioles. Cell 6? Yes. Yes, so interestingly, to my knowledge, there are no mutations known associated with cell 6 that cause diseases, also pointing towards uh, having a very important function, right? In contrast, ball 10, the SEP135, there are mutations known that cause ciliopathies. Hi, so uh, any idea of what is controlling the symmetry of the triplets in the absence of shock cis? <clears throat> so, as proposed in our model, um, this interdependence model, it seems that the microtubule wall has some propensity to form circular arranged structures. They vary between 8 and 10 fold. But somehow, and only in special situations in Chlamydomonas, you really have to treat the cell specially. There is a possibility to select out these structures without a cartwheel to form a centriole and a centrosome that is, its function is good enough for mediating cell division. However, the flagella and cilia that grow out of these um, uh, cartwheel-less centrioles, they are shorter. They don't move properly, so they have really severe defects. Uh, in human cells or in C. elegans, if you uh, knock out SAR6, there is no centriole duplication whatsoever. So Chlamydomonas, in that respect, is a bit a special situation, but I, I mentioned this again. You really have to treat the cells in a special way to get these 10% of cells that can form cilia and flagella that are aberrant. So during during S phase and you do, when you have the duplication, um, it's typically at right angles to the pre-existing central. How do you explain that? Mm -hmm. And also, what do you think is happening in S phase that triggers this? So the, 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 the perpendicular, nobody really knows how this is encoded. There is a kinase, a master kinase, PLK4, that somehow launches the program, but why it is launching it very locally at the proximal end of the model central in a perpendicular manner? That's a great uh, question to be answered. Uh, we don't know. And your second question was about? S, uh, S phase. Yes. Why is this, how is this coordinated to be happening in S phase? Yes, so what we know is that this kinase launches the program, starts recruiting these molecules, and the machinery then at some, uh, somehow then launches the entire process. R6, I just showed you, is necessary to build up the cartwheel, which is already important for then anchor the microtubules. Um, uh, and then the microtubule triple baits have to be assembled by another set of proteins. The mechanism we don't know really. But is this coupled to like cyclins? I mean, so if you have a G1S block um, that prevents you from going into S phase, you block this process. Sure. So it's truly yes. coupled to that whole mm -hmm. system. Yes, it is. It is actually coupled to um, DNA duplication and, and yes, to DNA duplication. Be back. 
Very nice. I, maybe I missed something. So if SAS 6 is required for the Cartwheel formation in the duplica duplicated centriole, what about the mother? Does it have SAS 6 as well, where you have the ninefold symmetry? Mm -hmm. So now this, this, this differs from species to species. In Chlamydomonas, the model centriole maintains the cartwheel. So the model centriole has also a cartwheel. Now if you go to human cells, actually it's quite puzzling. Nobody has ever seen the cartwheel, in, to my knowledge, in human cells. Although SAS6 is there and is essential for central duplication. So the idea is there that the cartwheel is formed at the very initial stages but then gets lost during a maturation process re relatively rapidly. Lost as, as protein is degraded? Um, I don't think this is known. So first it is somehow dissociates and eventually degrades. <coughs> but I don't think this is known. Do you think there's another machinery controlling the ninefold symmetry in the centrioles? Because uh, you said that in well type cells you could only see a ninefold centriole. And also, if you, in you included the 24 nm mutation, you could rarely see um, another kind of symmetry. So, do you think there must be another regulatory mechanism controlling that the assembly of the centrioles um, are only done? by ninefold symmetry? Mm. So, I personally think that um, SAS 6 plays an important role, there is no doubt. And for a very long time, this scaffold model was state of the art. And uh, just now with recent data, we have to assume that besides SAS 6, there are also other players that play a role. Amongst other things, also the microtubule wall itself. Uh, the microtubule wall in some organism itself can assemble not, not purely ninefold symmetric structures, but uh, can also preferentially go into ninefold symmetric structures. So I think this interdependence model um, suggests actually that there are also additional factors to make the process very robust. However, I think that SAR6 is really still a very important molecule that really um, is, is, is uh, uh, right in place and has the, the, the right features to ensure this ninefold symmetry. Hi. What is known about the, the triplets? So the interface between the microtubule triplets, how, as, are there molecules and proteins important to make the microtubules organize in triplets? Mm -hmm. So very little is known about that. I would love to know. For instance, I did not elude about that because these triplets, as you can see here schematically, they are composed of one complete microtubules and two half microtubules. So how is this, how is this done? Nobody knows. I don't even think that we, we know which molecules are involved in, in uh, generating this structure here. It's a very interesting uh, question, but I don't have any answer for that. Do you have any more questions? Ah, Manuel. So the symmetry is, is, is really key for the function of these structures, right? Because you said that, uh, that there's great defects in the, in the ones that have even a slightly different symmetry. What's the basis for that? <laughs> That's a very philosophical question, right? No, no, it's a very practical question. <laughs> it, meaning, I mean, I don't see a reason why nature couldn't have done everything with an eight-fold symmetric centriole. I, I don't really understand why nine is so important. Yeah, what I mean is, what are the specific defects that those uh, uh, flagella have when they don't have the right symmetry? They don't beat, they don't beat or, or, or beat in a weird manner. But, this but the molecular not, basis but this of is that not, is not clear. That does not tell us why ninefold symmetry is important, because all the, the other molecules, they have, had, they have been adopted to follow this ninefold symmetric structure. So just by changing the symmetry and you see defects, this does not tell us why ninefold is, is something useful, right? So. As I mentioned, I, I don't see. A, the, I think one could have done it also in a, with eightfold. So there was either a creator that created a ninefold symmetry, or evolution selected something that is ninefold. So 
So it's a philosophical question in the end. Okay, so we're actually running a bit over time, so unless there are any more questions which have to be discussed now, we could go on to the coffee break, which will be outside, as I understand.